So, okay, good. I think I did it. Oh no, now it's showing me a transcript of myself talking. I got to turn that off. Okay, so I am going to turn it over momentarily to Melody and Rachel, um, but I think everyone here except for Ava has been to a ULVLC before. So, you know, it's being recorded. Um, and so if you don't want, you know, your face in a recording, I don't know if we even put these on YouTube anymore, but just be aware um, that if you do come on camera, it will be captured in the recording. Um, please feel free to share chats. I'll keep an eye on the chat while uh, Rachel and thank you, Rachel. They do go on YouTube. Um, I will keep an eye on the chat while Melody and Rachel are presenting. So if you have questions or comments, please toss them in there. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to whoever is going first. Okay. Uh, Rachel, you good with me sharing screen? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Sure. All right. So is that full screen? It is not. Okay. It's is so everyone... cute though. Look at that. Love it. All right. <laughs> so everyone can see the slides. Great. Yes. Okay. So um, today, Rachel and I are going to talk to you a little bit about library outreach and kind of um, our sort of individual approaches and s some shared approaches that we take to library outreach. Uh, so we have this sort of um, subtitle. You're probably forgetting something because in the many years that we've done this, um, uh, you just kind of realize that there's so many small details that kind of go into library outreach. So um, I'm Melody Rude, uh, and sort of my experience with outreach and organizing and planning uh, can kind of be summed up um, through my five years as a student success librarian. Um, I've also co-curated three uh, really large scale art shows in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and then I've also uh, done a lot of like community organizing uh, uh, with events and raising money to support queer incarcerated populations. So I have a history doing that as well. And uh, Rachel? I'm Rachel Olson. I am currently the social sciences librarian and I've been at UNCG since the beginning of 2018. Um, I have worked with Chance, this actually might not be right. I think I've worked longer than six years with Chance, but anyway. Um, and then I have experience with SOAR, Rock and Welcome Week, and also a lot of experience with conference planning uh, with NCLA and also conference planning, or excuse me, planning the Leadership Institute with NCLA. Um, so like events both on campus and off campus and just all the events. So. Yeah, so um, we just wanted to share some images of some of the things that we've uh, worked on. So these are the art shows that I've curated. So the image on the top left kind of shows like the scale of the sh art show. And I'm in, in the back there. You can't really see me. But um, and then these are some of our student events that we've done that were really popular, including the Astrology Cafe. Uh, the planner party was pretty popular. We did a lot of Valentine's Day stuff, um, and uh, the queer cafe and therapy pets are also very important. Um, and these are pictures from UNCG Chance, which is an annual, um, for anybody watching the recording who may not know that UNCG Chance is an annual um, event that we do. It's week long. It's not just a library. It's a campus wide sort of effort admissions and the Office of Intercultural Engagement sort of spearhead it. Um, and I'm on the planning committee and they go all around campus. They take mock classes. Um, they do visit the library. You can see the the lower right picture is a shot of them in the library this past summer. Um, and these are high school students who identify as Hispanic or, or Latinx and they um, come to campus and learn all about college. So you can see some of the, the fun stuff. You can also see the top center um, picture that, that is Beth Ann Kelsch from archives uh, imparting her knowledge to our students. So yeah. All right, so um, we're gonna kind of talk about our individual approaches to outreach. So for me, it always starts with um, drafting an action plan. And uh, obviously everyone does things differently. And, you know, like what works for me doesn't always work for everyone else. But I'm somebody who needs to like write everything down because when I write something down, it like helps me think of other things that I need to write down. So just getting it down is really important for me. Um, and then having like an action plan is a great place where I can like put all of the 
moving parts of something in a single document. So things like um, a checklist of things I need to do, maybe like the written communication, like the marketing communication that's going to happen, um, or the justification email I need to send to Mike or whatever it is. Uh, there's a lot of things that can go into it and having it all together in one document helps, um, including uh, researching prices and adding a budget. Um, and like I said, sort of writing out those reasonings for uh, what it is, whatever it is I'm trying to do, um, like making connections to strategic goals and missions, uh, which kind of help justify uh, getting funds and stuff for events. Um, and then also uh, timing is really important to me. Um, and it's something that I've had to learn over the past few years. Uh, um, you know, what day has the most students on campus? When are students in class? Um, are there other events going on? Uh, how soon should you contact people? These are all things that are really uh, important to think about. And marketing is very important in thinking about like when the right time to market something is. Because uh, sometimes it can be too soon and sometimes it can be too late. Um, I just went tabled for a trio event that was marketed way too late. And uh, I I knew it was marketed too late uh, when I saw it. So I was really concerned. And when I went to table at the event, unfortunately, um, that, yeah, there was like, I, I think I interacted with five students and they rented the entire cone ballroom out. So uh, it, it is really important to, to consider timing. Um, my approach is a little bit different, and I will say that I am very much <laughs> wanting to adopt Melody's approach because I think that she is more organized than I am about some of the like justification, sort of planning things. I, For me, a lot of these things live in my mind, and I don't actually get around to putting them on paper, which I think is a mistake. So I highly recommend, like, put your thoughts on paper. Um, I uh, think about coming up with ideas for what it is that you want to do, which can be difficult, right? Like sometimes uh, we were talking just this morning, I said, you know, I want to do something for Halloween, but I don't actually have an idea for an event that I want to do. I just know I want to do something. So uh, running it by people that you trust is generally really helpful. Um, there are, you know, take advantage of the sort of collective brain power that exists and the collective experience that exists. And um, I have uh, run ideas by people very often and uh, people will be like, hey, are you sure that's a good idea because of X, Y, Z? Like there are often things that I haven't considered or don't know about. Um, so talking to other people is really helpful. <clears throat> not every idea is doable, um, or if it is doable, not every idea should be done. Um, and that's okay. Uh, it's you know, it's important not to put pressure on yourself to try to do all the things, uh, right? I think we have to be selective in terms of our time and energy and resources about what we are able to do. So don't, you know, don't be discouraged if you have an idea um, and it just doesn't work out. Um, so who's impacted? Who might want to participate? These are really big questions. Um, what do you want people to get out of the event or experience? And what do other people want to get out of the event or the experience? It's important to um, kind of go outside yourself a little bit. And then is there anybody who might want to participate that you're not thinking of? And is it a good idea for them to participate? I think that um, sometimes asking those questions can be uh, really important, both for making sure that the right people are included um, or that they are included in the right ways, because it might not always be the role that immediately comes to mind. So. All right. And so these are some shared um, approaches that we have. Um, uh, do you want to just uh, go section by section, Rachel? Yeah, that sounds good. I can do this first one if you want. Sure. Um, so getting things set up in the beginning, thinking about, I hate to call it the red tape, but like thinking about the red tape, the hoops that you might need to jump through logistically. So um, contacting stakeholders, volunteers, things like that. Do it as early as possible. I will send, I'll start sending chance emails in like April and it seems wild to people, um, but starting to think about those things, get those things set up as early as possible can really save you some stress um, down the road. Sending follow-up emails and messages is also really important, reminding people like, hey, um, I'm still looking for help with this, or you signed up to help with this, or are you still available, things like that. And also, um, I think one thing that I sometimes don't think enough about, and I'm getting better at, is 
I might understand and have context for an event or for a particular thing that I'm asking people to do, but they may not have that same context. Mm -hmm. And so following up and explaining, you know, why things are happening and, and like give, giving people as much of the story as is appropriate and as you can. Um, creating a backup plan for volunteers is really important because things happen. People have kids, people get sick, people, you know, all kinds of situations go on. Um, so having a backup plan is appropriate. Um, there may be forms that you need to fill out. We have uh, an event planning committee in the library and, and we're meant to fill out those. Uh, they think that they have a form that we're meant to fill out before events, making sure that, you know, one thing that I always tend to forget about at events is trash cans. Um, have you asked the appropriate folks to, to help you make sure that you have things like that available? Um, Knowing the procedures for purchasing and who needs to be contacted, there are often forms to be filled out with that um, approval that you need to get. And then if you are working with conference centers, things like that, this comes into play with NCLA a lot. Think about contractual obligations that you might have. So for larger scale events, there are things like food and beverage minimums that have to be met. I know that's something we struggle with every year with NCLA um, at the convention center. Also thinking about things like um, are there, uh, we have hotel room blocks and we're expected to, you know, fill a certain number of those. So thinking about it both before and after you sign the contracts, are these realistic things that you can, that you can meet? Yeah. And, um, you know, a calendar is going to be uh, super important if you are, you know, trying to organize any sort of event or um, a large scale orientation type thing. Um, or conferences. And one thing that is really important is to remember that the prep time is work. Um, so treat it with respect and block off your calendar. Um, I always like during the summertime, uh, block off time uh, to prep for August, uh, August orientation and all of that stuff. Um, you know, it, it definitely does require uh, work that goes into it. So it's important that we uh, keep that in mind. Um, you know, even when I was like filling out my, um, when I was putting together all of my um, outreach events that I've uh, been involved with for my tenure packet, uh, I even like made a note that like it, it like I had a, um, an appendix which had a, a document of dates and what the event was, but I also made sure to include a statement that said that it did not include all of the prep time that went in involved into it because I wanted to make sure that like people who were reading that were aware that it was it wasn't just the event that there's all this prep time that goes into it as well. Um, considering setup time and breakdown time is also really important. So like you know if you have um, a volunteer who's going to come uh, table at like. 9 a.m. and, uh, you know, uh, but that's like the start time, then uh, maybe communicate with them to get there a little earlier or you yourself get there earlier. But, you know, planning those things um, uh, is important. And that's something, uh, you know, we had had a plan for high school to visit us recently, um, but it they weren't able to come due to the hurricane. But um, the uh, a lot of things that like like little things that you wouldn't think of it's like oh they're just gonna go from here to here but like they don't know where the you know like where archives is they don't know where the labs are so uh building in that time for transitions is also important when it comes to scheduling um and then debriefing and assessment is a great way to reflect and think about like what worked what didn't um were there any lessons learned um and you know uh, asking yourself like uh, how you want to evaluate the success of something because sometimes uh, it's not just about numbers it's about like the impact it's had on students or um, whatever it may be uh, we've had events that have had smaller crowds but like seem to be very meaningful and then we have events that reach a lot of students which um, you know it's just us handing out goodies which is also very meaningful too but um, it's not just a numbers thing um, so thinking about how you want to evaluate the success of a program and what information did you gather and what data was unnecessary so this is something that I know Rachel and I have both fought a little bit with some student success offices on campus where um, they want us to like take a lot of information and data on our students that sometimes we don't think is necessary um, so uh, 
like Spartan Connect is like a big thing where they want us to like have these like swipers out for every event. But, um, you know, something as simple as that can be a barrier to a student who, um, you know, like otherwise, you know, they don't have their ID on them or just, you know, it's just one extra thing that would keep them from doing something. Um, so uh, that is something that I am often thinking about. All right, so a couple of examples of um, some of the things that I've worked on. Um, I'm going to just click on this. So this is one example of an action plan that I've created for um, a Valentine's Day OER event that um, I created um, my first academic year that I was here. Um, so you can see as like a description of what it is. There's an estimated budget with like links to, um, you know, whatever it is that I need. There was like logistics, time frame, that kind of thing. So that's like one example. And they don't always look like this. Um, this was sort of like an earlier version of how I used to organize things. Um, this is a larger scale, much larger scale program um, grant that uh, uh, Amy and I created, which was based on our um, former OER grants that Sam and I used to run together. Um, but uh, the provost asked us to increase our program pretty significantly um, to award up to $50,000 in grant funds. So, um, you know, this has like our justification, it has our goals, our stretch goals, um, potential barriers, so things that we were really thinking about, um, desired outcomes. There's a whole budget section here with a link to a more detailed budget, timeline. All of these types of things are pretty necessary when you're planning something that at this scale. Um, it's it's worth thinking about these things and having these things on hand. Oops, back into present mode here. Um, and then this is one that Joe and I did when Joe was still here, our um, former uh, GIS and data visualization librarian for the Queer Cafe. Um, this was a grant proposal that we put together, but this is sort of like, um, it has a lot of the same information. It has sort of a justification, language, outcomes. We've got budget and like sort of things that we need to do and plan for evaluation. All right. And then these are more, I could not find a link for the first one. Okay. Um, these are more about um, sort of after the fact, sort of justifying, you know, what you're doing or showing showing people what you're doing. So this one is a presentation that um, myself and some of the Chance Committee folks did this past summer at a conference for student affairs professionals. Um, and this is actually more about um, efforts related to Hispanic and Latin A students on our campus as a whole. Um, and so I think something that's really important about doing outreach is sharing what you've done, um, telling other people about it, you know, because I think that um, a lot of times we don't celebrate enough the things that we're doing and we don't, you know, give ourselves credit and, and say, hey, this is, you know, a look back at this thing that we did and it's really important. And I think it also kind of forces you when you're doing presentations like this to do some of that critical reflection saying like what could have been better what would we like to do next time it can also just give you sort of an appreciation for um how much this takes um especially i mean something like chance which is just sort of an ongoing campus-wide thing it is really um a, a treat every year to look back at what we've done because whew, we're tired um and it, it helps us have motivation to keep going because it's a nice look at what we've accomplished and then this last thing is, is very similar um this other one is a conference that we did um out in california in 2023 at a specific conference preparate is specifically related to um helping students who identify as hispanic and latin a prepare to go to college um and so presenting about the chance program specifically uh was part of that and i think it is cool to hear from other people around the country, especially outside of the library field, um, what they're doing. And it's just, uh, it's energizing and it's helpful because sometimes you get really good ideas or people ask questions about things you hadn't considered before. So that's what this is about. Oh my gosh. Sorry. Okay. No, you're good. <laughs> All right. So we talked a little bit about this, but like, you know, really thinking about logistics is really key when you're organizing um, events and 
Um, sometimes, you know, like people will think, oh, a tabling event is just a tabling event. You just need a tablecloth and the items that you need to take. Right. But there's so many little things that, um, go into it that like, uh, Rachel and I do sort of behind scenes that people don't see. So like, you know, I have usually a tablecloth and items prepared for people to go if they uh, are volunteering, but, you know, they might not see the emails that I sent to Jennifer requesting swag. They don't see the emails that I've um, sent out prior to, um, you know, Amy requesting to purchase some items or uh, whatever it may be. There's there's a lot to go um, into it. So this is just like a breakdown of an example, like a simple tabling event, um, you know, you might not think that it would have all of these checklist things, but like there are things that go into it. Like, did you uh, confirm your participation with the group that you're working with? Uh, did you double check if there was a secondary location, if it's outside in case it rains, something like that? Um, that's a big thing with a uh, fall kickoff. Um, you know, did you get the proper amount of volunteers? Did you email them and make sure that they're aware of what time and where they need to be? Um, you know, double checking that there's like the trash cans and the tablecloths and the, the things that you need for the event to be successful. Um, and then uh, there's kind of the the coordinator's uh, point of view. And then there's also the volunteer, uh, the person who's volunteering's point of view. So, you know, making sure that you are arriving a little early to set up, um, you know, making sure that you are filling out the information in our um, outreach event form, all of that stuff. There's just a lot to think about. Um, and, you know, it's not the end of the world if one of these things gets forgotten. It's it's really not that big of a deal. But, um, you know, being organized just makes it easier for everybody else. Um, uh, yeah. And then this is an example. Um, so the one on the right uh, on the top is what I do every year when the chance students come to the library, it's a breakdown of like who should be where at what time and like where are they going? Melody was talking about building in transition time. I have this chart every year that I use and it feels uh, it feels like I'm being insane every year when I set this up. I'm like, oh my God, people are going to think that I am just micromanaging this and, and whatever. Um, but I think it really does help when you have 100 students in the building at the same time, figuring out how to avoid traffic jams, um, things like that. So it um, tells people where to go, uh, even what route to take, um, which, again, I always feel crazy, but I hear from people every year that they appreciate knowing uh, where to go and what to do. Um, and then also the, the image on the lower left is um, our chance planning committee spreadsheet. Um, it's this massive sort of thing that we have every year that we share with everybody. It's got all kinds of color coding, um, all kinds of different things related to how we're going to make that event run. Thank you, Lois. Thank you for the validation. <laughs> um, yeah, so the um, <clears throat> the chance spreadsheet is great uh, and it has uh, sort of become a, a important tool for our planning and we have breakdowns of every day and I'm happy to show that to people if folks are interested later. Yeah, but like, you know, Rachel, what you were saying about sort of like if sometimes it feels like you're micromanaging, but it's not. It's it's just anticipating potential disastrous situations and trying to right. avoid it at yeah. best. Uh, and so, yeah, I as someone who helps with volunteers with the like teaching portions of like chance, uh, I always really appreciate knowing when and where the the um, transition people are coming from. So it's great. I think, yeah, I think once you've seen how things could possibly go wrong, you're like, okay, yeah, no, this is appropriate. I think, I think that's yeah. fair. Um, all right. So uh, we're going to just kind of give some tips now on like how we approach things, um, how we approach uh, outreach and event planning and like large scale organizing. Um, so one big thing is know your audience. And so uh, these are some reflections that we have about our UNCG students and how they engage with us with events. Um, the one thing is that uh, uh, our students are very appreciative of things um, in a way that uh, surprised me a little bit. Uh, they are always uh, excited and uh, thankful to uh, be given any anything for free <laughs> or like any information. They, they're just very appreciative people. Um, and I think anyone who has ever tabled um, could definitely, uh, would definitely agree with that. 
Um, another thing is that students are busy and most of them have jobs in addition to their classes. So creating events that work with their busy schedules is important. That's why we like to do a lot of like pop-up type events where they can just kind of stop in and uh, take what they want, do what they want, and then leave. Those types of events are very popular in the library and work really well for our students. But at the same time, they do like downtime activities. So whenever we've done any sort of like creative, like crafting or like zine making, something like that, um, we always get like a handful of students who will stop and like interact with it um, for more than like, you know, 30 minutes to an hour. Um, so I, I do think that they like those like crafting downtime activities as well. Um, one thing I've noticed too is that um, Asking is not always the cultural norm for some of our students, um, so uh, they uh, we, we shouldn't expect students to just like ask to take something on our table, uh, but like really encouraging them to do so um, sometimes is needed or else uh, they won't. Um, so that is uh, something to know about our students um, and that they remember positive experiences because they tell us uh, we, you know, I, I get a lot of like uh, personal anecdotes from students where they're like, oh, yeah, you were at this event and like we did this and it was it was cool, you know, so they do remember those positive experiences. Yeah, and, and I mean, one thing I give this spiel every year before SOAR to, to the folks who work at the library, your smile may not be the thing that like brings students back. It may not be the thing that they remember, but an unfriendly interaction or an unpleasant interaction might be the thing that keeps them from coming back. And that's not to like scare people or make people think they have to be perfect or anything like that, but it's just like people are going to remember how you made them feel. Um, and so I think it's important to be as positive as you can uh, it's to the extent that is reasonable. So, Yeah. All right. So another thing to keep in mind um, has to do with code switching and emotional labor. Rachel, do you want to take this slide? Yeah, I think that, you know, Melody has some great points that she's put on here. I agree with these. I think that we have to, we have to speak the language of higher ed and speak the language of student success when we're looking for buy-in and resources for programs. So thinking about this idea of return on investment, like in higher ed, as, as we all know, you have to prove why you're worth the money that it costs to, to have you do your thing. Um, and you know, ideologies that lack nuance, and I really like the way that, that Melody put this, saying things like the library is the heart of the university, the library is the center of the university, like that's very, um, I, I appreciate the positive spirit that goes behind that, but it just really does lack nuance, and there's so many things that attitudes like that don't take into consideration, um, and it can be a real slap in the face to other places on campus that, you know, like, we're, we're what's most important. Not, I think you have to be really careful with, with messaging like that. Um, you do often have to collaborate with stakeholders who seem or are out of touch with the reality that a lot of our students are facing, you know, so people, to, people who have not necessarily spent a lot of time with students students because that's that's just not their role that's just not their job um, and so trying to understand and communicate with folks um, while also standing firm because we've been in front of the students and we you know we feel like we have a good understanding of um, what it's going to take and, and what's going to be most helpful so those things are absolutely um, it, code switching is, is a perfect way to describe kind of what you have to do there um, being on is absolutely emotional labor. Just thinking about being on right now is, whew, uh, it's a lot. And yeah, you want to be warm and inviting, but you don't want to perpetuate toxic positivity, right? Like the world is, the world is wild and students have so much going on in their lives and we don't want to tell them to, you know, I'm someone who, uh, I am unable to leave it at the door. A lot of the times that leave it at the door mentality comes in when we're thinking about things like work. But also I think sometimes um, events that can just kind of meet students where they are and not ask them to, to be on or, or to put on any sort of, um, any sort of outward mask is really helpful. Just let them be who they need to be. Um, messages around being strong for our students. Yeah, I mean, there are absolutely times where we are also needing to be met where we are as the people running these events and as the people dealing with students on a on a day to day basis. Um, 
absolutely some stakeholders do not consider your well-being when it goes against their organized programming. Um, I think that when we've collaborated with other departments around campus, they want it to be successful, right? They want it to be, um, it's the most important thing in their mind and it's the most important thing happening in their world. Um, sometimes things happen, sometimes people get sick, sometimes people are having major things happening in their lives um, and comments get made and, and things happen in the past. And um, <laughs> we could tell you some wild stories once we're not recording. Um, I think that putting your own needs um, before, you know, some of these things is absolutely valid. And uh, that's been a very hard learned lesson for me. Uh, you don't need to lose sleep over this stuff. You don't need to make it your whole, uh, I'm, I'm saying this really badly, Melody, but like uh, put your put your own well-being, um, don't be afraid to prioritize that, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And then, um, being upbeat and relatable uh, is absolutely labor. It absolutely takes energy and it is absolutely very rarely re rewarded. That doesn't often get recognized. Like you uh, you did this thing that sapped you um, and we're not really going to give you any credit for that because we're just counting the number of students that came to your event, never mind what the cost was to you. Um, so none of these things are, are meant to be unkind uh, because we all have our own sort of things going on. Um, but these are some very real um, sort of costs of doing outreach and things like this that don't get seen all the time. Yes, and so we have um, just um, a few slides left that just kind of go through some of uh, some more tips that we have. Um, but, you know, a big one is that outreach and student success is everyone's job. It's in our missions, it's in the strategic plan, you know, it's it's going to be in every single like mission or strategic plan out there. Um, so uh, although, you know, we have these positions that are created to help coordinate things, um, it is not the job of the coordinator to um, fill in every single volunteer slot there is. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, like being short staffed is like a reality. And it's, it's, hard to like volunteer for things if you've got a million other stuff going on um and that's totally fine but uh um you know there the reality of being in the coordinator position is that if you don't get enough volunteers then you fall in, then it falls on you to to fill in those spots um so that can kind of be a lot but um you know just really re-emphasizing that um you know as a library it's everyone's job and i feel like i've i've tried really hard in the past couple of years to to open opportunities up to everybody in the library um and uh i i've noticed that uh, like you know we've got representation from every single department um at some of these events and that's just i, I really love to see that it's really wonderful yeah, it's whether you're in a public services role or not, um, it is very much your job to help with outreach. I just want to repeat that for the recording. It's everyone's job. All right. Um, Go ahead. Go for it. No, no, you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so consider your re resources and then lower your expectations. This is a big one. Um, just because, uh, you know, like we're limited with what we have at UNCG. Um, but I would say, you know, anywhere really, um, like it's, it's great to think big and, and have these great ideas on like what something can look like or what it can be. Um, but realistically based on like what we have available to us and the bandwidth that people have to carry something out, um, sometimes, you know, just grabbing cute decorations and putting them up and like, um, you know, having a nice event is all you can do. Um, and so, uh, when you have people come come at you with like these really wonderful ideas, but they have, um, you know, no uh, plan on how they will like carry it out, um, you know, it's it's just not realistic. And so that's why uh, we do some of the same events that work and are like useful for uh, our students and that our students seem to like over and over again. Um, not because we are like being lazy and we don't want to try something new. It's just that like it requires a lot of work. And sometimes, you know, when people come with come to us with really wonderful ideas, um, like, you know, as the coordinator, we see the like we see the cha-ching, you know, like we see the money, like how the the like the amount of work that's going to be put into it. And so um, 
you know, I, I think I luckily, I think at UNCG, a lot of our sort of um, low stakes, but high impact um, outreach and like programming that we do is like really successful with students. And it doesn't require a lot like things like our whiteboard Wednesdays that we do. Uh, students really engage with those. Um, and it's so simple. It's just putting up a question every week. Um, so that's like something that, uh, you know, doesn't use any resources. Um, um, but has a high impact. Um, clarity is super important. Again, like I was saying earlier, making sure I have the context for this event and I have the context for what's happening around campus with this particular thing. The people that are volunteering or helping out may not have that context. And so I'm um, reminding yourself to um, slow down a little bit, make sure that everybody feels like they are comfortable with what we're doing, why we're doing it, you know, why we're here, what our, what our purpose is. Um, that is super important to remember. This one is huge. This is a, like, I, this is engraved on my heart because you can only control yourself. And this is something that has been sort of a hard learned lesson for me over the years. Um, you can't control what happens with other people. You can't control how people react to your event. Maybe you thought it was a really great idea and only like three students showed up. And that's okay because for those three students, it could have been, you know, really, really meaningful. Um, getting upset over things that are outside of your control is a waste of your time and your emotional energy. Um, and it is so much harder. It's, it's easy to say and it's really hard to do. Um, but just sometimes you just got to let it go when mm -hmm. things don't go your way. Especially yeah. when it comes to like collaborative events, like if you did everything that you were supposed to and you showed up and you brought your people, but like, you know, a group that you were collaborating with doesn't show up in the same way, um, you, you don't have to answer for them because like they knew what the commitment was. Um, you're not responsible for uh, somebody else's, um, you know, uh, whatever it is that's going on and, you know, like things do happen where people can't show up to things, but, um, but yeah, just, you can only control yourself. Um, considering logistics to the smallest detail, I know we've already harped on this a lot, but again, uh, are you serving food? Do you have tongs? Did you uh, get trash cans? Do you have napkins? Do you have hand sanitizer nearby? Um, did you consider like allergies? There's a lot of things that go into um, even the simplest sort of outreach events. Um, so really thinking about like what what are the things that um, are invisible when they're there? You don't notice them because they are there, but when they are not there, it's really obvious. So things like a trash can when you're like trying to find a place to throw away your like you know your cupcake wrapper or something, it's really obvious when it's not there because you don't have it and you need it. Um, so thinking about those sort of invisible things that kind of make an event. A uh, quick horror story about that, just very quick. Uh, chance one year, we were expecting 400 people for breakfast. They were coming in an hour, and we realized that we had never settled the question of who was responsible for napkins, cups, plates, forks, knives. So they weren't there, and we had to run out and get them. So like, I, I walk myself through, if I were attending this event, what were all the things that I'm going to interact with and need? Uh, yeah, it's important. Yeah. Um, we already talked about this, but coordinating is not the same as volunteering. So um, usually when we're coordinating, uh, we're also like including ourselves in the volunteer responsibilities, but we definitely do need help from everybody because, um, uh, you know, just being responsible for coordinating something doesn't mean that you are responsible for all of the volunteer that volunteering uh, opportunities that come with it. And then this is a big one. Remember to thank everybody um, who helps out because it really does, you know, take a village. Um, make sure that you are thanking Will who sets up the table for you in the morning or, or you know, or uh, campus catering when they come in and, and they bring the food for you. Uh, the people who showed up for uh, for you, the volunteers, the students, uh, just really uh, being thankful to people for helping out. This is another one, again, it's burned into my brain. Be flexible. Um, we tell our interns all the time here, there's no such thing as a bibliographic emergency. Like, and one thing, especially when we're doing chants, the approach that we take is we have 100 high schoolers here. If no one is hurt, if no one's safety or health has been compromised, um, it's gonna be okay. 
it's fine if things don't fall into place. Sometimes um, you have to just roll with it. Sometimes you have to just let it go. Being being rigid, being afraid to uh, just kind of let things happen and, and do your best, that will not help you. Just stay flexible. It takes a lot of practice. <laughs> it takes a lot of time, especially for those of us like me who are uh, anxiety ridden. Um, you just have to learn to breathe and it's okay. If no one is hurt, it's going to be all right. So, yeah, this is one that I, I still struggle with myself. Um, but you know, the idea of like the super organizing ahead of time is that like, you can avoid situations where you need to like suddenly shift gears. But, uh, I, I have had to learn to like be flexible and go with the flow when things don't go as planned. And this is basically everything that we just um, went over, just sort of written out. But yeah, that is basically it for our uh, advice on doing outreach. And we can take some questions if people have them. Thank you so much, Melody and Rachel. Um, we are totally open um, for questions. So please feel free to put questions in the chat or raise your hand if you want to ask them. I have a couple, so I'll start with one. Um, one to me is you, you're, you've you mentioned this, that sort of like, you know, it's everyone um, contributes to student success and how important that is to our mission as a university and things like that. So if there are folks who, let's say, can't um, or aren't comfortable like being at uh, an outreach table or um, giving tours. What are some ways that people can still contribute to these events, even if they might not be comfortable with maybe that face-to-face -face part, or they might not, it might not work with their schedule or like what, how can people still um, be participating? Oh my gosh, there's so many ways. And I'm sure Rachel can think of a million chance things <laughs> like people could yes. be doing. But we same with SOAR, too. like, uh, you know, I, like I get a set amount of like dates that we will be tabling for SOAR. And so I like to pre-create uh, bags of swag for that. Um, I get a number from um, Jennifer, I get different items. And so that's something that someone could do. Like, you know, uh, if they had some free time, they could just like put 35 pieces of swag in a bag, you know, uh, 10 times or um, uh, print flyers. Uh, we're always out of flyers, like every single tabling event, like True, I have to are. print more flyers. So that's yeah. like, that's something that could be done. Um, uh, yeah, Rachel, I'm sure you have a million things that you can do too. I was thinking on, sort of on the flyer note, if you have graphic design skills or if you have, mm -hmm. you know, anything like that, you can help make the flyer for the event. Like, like thinking about the marketing and the advertising. Um, I am not a graphic designer. Uh, Canva is it helps all the time. But so for people who do have those actual skills, um, it's really, uh, that's definitely one way you can contribute. So if you're good with, with graphic design or something like that, you can help come up with the marketing. Yeah. Awesome. And like, yeah, thank you. I think, uh, this most, yeah, this past or like, I, I feel like I utilize Nick so much to like, just help me carry boxes. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. Just like meet me at the curb to, to bring in boxes and stuff like that so and there are virtual SOAR sessions I know there's one coming up in January unless I just made that up so if that's something that's of interest um but virtual volunteers are are there is absolutely need so awesome thank y'all um so uh there is a sort of related question from Charlie in the chat about the social media form um, I know we've had some issues with forms not working because of the Microsoft transition. So um, I wonder if that might be related. Um, to the best of my knowledge, that URL has not changed. I'm looking at it right now, and it looks like it's okay on my end. So I might, I might try a different browser. I blame Microsoft is the short answer. Um, I might try a different browser. Um, I'll drop the link in the chat if you want to take a look and see if that one might work. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, blame Clippy. Yep. <laughs> but yes, that's very important making sure if you do have any forms or anything associated with the outreach that you're doing, sign up forms, anything, test it, make sure it's working, get other people to help you test it. Um, because again, with the unpredictability of technology, you never know if it works on your end, it may not work on someone else's. Mm, that's a good point, especially with 
if those of us who were very comfortable using like Google Sheets and Google Docs for sign up stuff, and it just doesn't work the same way in in Microsoft. It you know it it can be close, but it's just not as easy. So, all right, what other questions do people have for Melody and Rachel? When I was new to teaching, um, someone taught me to sing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star to myself after I say, are there any questions? Um, because I, like many people, had this problem where I'd be like, are there any questions? No? Okay, let's move on. Um, so now that we do a lot of stuff online, I do it twice. And then I do things like this where I just talk until I see <laughs> if anybody has a... Okay, I have one more then. If... if no one has one yet, but please feel free to add them or again, raise your hand. Um, okay, so you talked about the sort of emotional labor and I know this is something that I've experienced as well with like outreach or or even, you know, teaching things like that where you have to be really on and um, it takes a lot out of you. So what kind of things do y'all do to help mitigate that or to care for yourself after you've had like, a pretty intense, you know, outreach. Like I know for you, Melody, we've talked about this and, you know, August, there's just this big time where you're just slammed almost every day. There's, there's an event. So how do you, how do you take care of yourself in those situations when you have expended a lot of that effort and put in a lot of emotional labor? One thing that I do, and I think Rachel does this too, is like take time off after those long stretches. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. um, I know for me, the the sort of like SOAR is pretty organized in the summertime and it, it like so like the organization of SOAR is actually like requires more work than actual tabling and to like giving tours and stuff like that. But like that first couple of weeks of August are always like there's just so much because we're doing like international student orientation uh regular student or like you know the fall soar fall kickoff all of rock and welcome week graduate student or you know there's students. just like yeah so many things yeah. there's a lot going on and i feel like uh yeah there's like a stretch of time where like i'm always doing something um or involved with something for like 10 days in a row and then i'll i'll just take a day off or take a long weekend or something like that. Um, I'm not super great about honestly, like self-care after I, 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 I just go home and I, I like don't talk to anybody and I kind of rot a little bit. <laughs> I that. That's like the truth, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, you know, one thing that's really helped me is I, and Melody has, has taught me a lot about, boundaries and let's let's work on some self-care and let's work on you know thinking about what we need um which is an amazing life skill that i didn't have before so now i don't work after five unless it's like a specially scheduled event where i flex my schedule you know whatever um but i don't uh i don't i don't work when i'm not working you know i have i have the set hours that i stick to as best as i can um and i really try hard not to answer email not to think about work not to you know any of those things outside of those hours and it's really hard to do because i used to you know do a lot more and and not take that approach so it's been a hard habit to learn um but i have definitely noticed an uptick in just like my general well-being so just not so much after the event, but just sort of all along changing your approach to how you handle um, uh, work. Yeah. And also asking for what you need. Like, I think the whole coordination is not volunteering thing. That's very true. And there are times when um, if you're not getting the volunteers you need, if you're not getting the help you need, then reaching out to the powers that be and saying, hey, um, I can't do this without this. So can you help me find a way to get to the number of people that I need or otherwise we're going to have to figure out how we can scale it back. Um, and so the power of no is another very important tool for me. I think that's it. That's a, everything that y'all have said is, is really good. I think that's a particularly important point um, because we are as library personnel, like we are really good at figuring it out and working it out and making it work. Um, and, you know, I think that benefits our students, but I do also feel like it 
it some, makes some of that hard work a little invisible if it just always kind of looks like it works out um, and people aren't seeing any of that struggle. And so, you know, coming from my perspective as a supervisor, I definitely always want to hear, um, you know, like like Rachel said, if if there's not enough volunteers, what do we need to do? How do we how do we want to engage people? How do we want to make it easy for people to volunteer um, and that kind of thing? So, yeah, we've definitely done like like check ins with like bandwidth and with like how are people feeling? Can can we handle this? Can we do this? Mm -hmm. And if the general feeling is no, then like then that's it. You know, that's that's the answer. And I think that like having good boundaries, um, you know, it's not just good for you. It's good for everybody, because uh, if you say no to things that you can't do uh, and you're firm about it, then like people higher up do see that like support is needed. Mm -hmm. And like Jenny was saying, if it always manages to get done, if someone always takes on more so that it just gets done, then like people who do the hiring and stuff like that, th you know, they see it getting done. So there's not an issue. So uh, it is it is good for everybody to, um, you know, practice good boundaries. But it's hard with things like outreach, too, because like, you know, like it, it's it is balancing a lot of like, you know, us preaching, like have good boundaries, but also like, please volunteer, but also like, yeah, you know, right. right. Um, so, yeah, you, you can't pour from an empty cup and sometimes you need other people to understand that your cup is empty and that's OK. It's and having having supervisors like Jenny who are supportive and human and understanding of, you know, all those different things is is also really important. So if you're a supervisor out there, please help your people. With yeah, we did. Uh, I strive did. to be as human as I can. It's true. It's not Very always human. easy. We were doing some like Saturday tabling event like yeah. that we started doing last year and like. The past couple of times we did it, we just like no interaction. And so like being able to go to Jenny and just be like, hey, I don't I don't know that it's worth having people come to come into the office yep. on a day that they wouldn't be here um, for this. Um, and Jenny was supportive of that. So, Well, and particularly when it takes a lot of coordination from a lot of people, it's just all this labor that builds up. So yeah. Um, well, thank you both. I haven't seen any other questions come in. Um, yeah, it's a good a good point in the chat there from Charlie to just, you know, be able. And I think that both um, at Melody and Rachel have been really, I can say this again, as their supervisor, have been really good about coming with explanations and with like uh alternatives I, I think that sometimes is is the you know sometimes it's like it's just a little bit easier to say um oh we can't do this but what about this that's maybe a little easier to coordinate or um requires a little bit less work on the front end or back end or you know whatever it might be so well thank y'all so much um for sharing and for all of the hard work that you do with your coordination of course many people here in this ULVLC session and also who might be watching later have also participated in many of these events. Um, and, you know, we're always grateful for that. And our students are too. I really want to echo what Melody and Rachel have both said, which is like, even if sometimes you're like, well, I'm just standing at this table handing stuff out. It's like very meaningful to some students who are like, I didn't have a chance to buy post-it notes yet. And I have post-it notes now or, um, like HSML, I've got a couple of HSML people here. Maybe sometimes someone just really needs a tiny harmonica and, and you have them down there or you may not anymore, but you did until recently. So, you know, sometimes we are providing things that, um, we don't even realize how much students are appreciating. Um, but then every once in a while, a student will say something to me like, oh, I want like a library table at SOAR and like, um, I got a pen that I still use all the time. You know, it's just little things like that where I'm like, gosh, that that's it's meaningful. There is high impact there. So thank you all so much. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, I am going to be assuming that Sam will 
handle all the rest of the tech part of this when she is um, back in the office. Um, but if you have um, questions or ideas for other ULVLC sessions, please send those to me and Sam. Um, we know that with the phase one of the renovation quickly approaching, there might be a little more hybrid in people's schedules and people might be interested in um, even more ULVLC sessions. So let us know your thoughts, your ideas. Uh, we would love to hear them. And one last thanks to Melody and Rachel. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.